Please stand and join me in welcoming Dr. Jean Wayne. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Francis. Wow. I'm here because Francis asked me to be here. And he's a hard man to turn down. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. You know, this is my hometown. I love Douglas, and that's why we're all here. Uh, quite an honor to be on this stage, especially after that array of women leaders that just. Wow. Uh, it's fun to speak to an audience like this. Uh, not many times in my life I get to speak to a group of people where I'm related to half of the audience. Uh, <laughs> I have a lot of cousins here, and uh, I'm actually related to Francis. I don't admit that very often. But that's <laughs> Uh, you know, one of the reasons Francis wanted me to speak to you was I have some experience with fundraising, and, and, and you know, that's part of the job, as we know, of being university president. It's also part of the job of being secretary of the Smithsonian, because only about half its funds come from the federal government, and a lot of that has to come from philanthropy. I've been fortunate in fundraising. I've learned a lot from an awful lot of people about it, and I'll share a few words about that. Uh, I was able to raise uh, uh, 50 million dollars from Bill Gates, and I was very proud of that for an important cause at uh, the Smithsonian. One of which was to reach new audiences, 30 million dollars in endowment, to help the Smithsonian reach an audience that it does not reach. Uh, when I went to the Smithsonian, it was very obvious to me uh, that this typical uh, uh, 30 million people come and visit, but that's typically a college-educated audience and it typically not include minority. And so there, and it doesn't include many rural folks. And so that endowment of $30 billion allows us only to work hard today to reach communities that didn't reach before. Here in Douglas, uh, my friend Frankie Snow is here, and I managed to con him out of a piece of his treasured collection of Altima Hall grit. And uh, Frankie, uh, I got that, him to donate it to the Smithsonian so Frankie is a donor to the Smithsonian uh, because uh, when I looked at their rock collection, I was embarrassed to find out they had no alt Mahal grit. <laughs> and so Frankie helped me rectify that, and he is officially a donor uh, to the Smithsonian. And the point being, you can help out institutions in a lot of different ways, from rocks to money. Money is a little better most of the time. <laughs> uh, so it's, you know, we're all here tonight, and I'm here, because we love this place. I was born here, lived here for 13 years before my family, for financial reasons, had to leave. My mother and father came back when they retired. Many of you are here because you moved here. Some of our speakers uh, had moved here, and you followed in love with this place. That's why we're here, and that's the common reason that makes us here tonight. Uh, my family has deep roots here. Uh, my family came down from New England in the 1830s and settled in Waycross, and then gradually here in Douglas. Uh, my great-grandfather was mayor of Douglas, uh, Daniel Gaskin, Sr., in 1917. Uh, my father, who was named after Daniel Gaskin, his name was Daniel Gaskin Clough, was mayor of Douglas in 1949, 1950. And we heard the great story of the medical center here tonight. His platform was to get a hospital built in Douglas. And so, not the one you have now, which is really a great center, but the predecessor to that. Uh, my father had a lot to do with getting that hospital built. Um, you know, I, and I do have a lot of relatives here because my mother had nine brothers and sisters. They were family, uh, country people. And my dad had eight brothers and sisters. So I have lots of relatives here. And uh, they loved Douglas. They had to leave twice because of economic reasons. And yet they ended their life here. And they rest today in peace in the Douglas City Cemetery along with my grandparents and many other of my relatives. Now, I have a bit of a unique perspective about Douglas because, as I mentioned, I left here uh, when I was a teenager and came back off and on to visit relatives and grandparents and so forth. And over time, I came back just to see friends and relatives. And so I've seen Douglas change a long time. I mean, I've been on this earth a fair amount of time. I'm 74. Uh, so I've had a chance to see Douglas from a perspective that many of you in this audience don't because you live here. You, you, you live it. And sometimes things happen in a community that you don't see because you are so close to it. 
but I have a chance to see it and understand a little bit about what's uh, going on. Also, I've had, because of my career, the opportunity to travel all over the world. And I have seen communities, small towns, big towns, big cities, all over the world. And because of a research project I'm doing about South Georgia that I'm writing a book about, Frankie's helping me with, I've seen many small towns in South Georgia. And what you see is not all towns are equal. And that goes to big cities all the way down to small communities. Here in South Georgia, many small towns are in fact dying. They're not doing well. Some are holding their own. Douglas is one of those unique ones that is doing very well. And I think we know that there's a reason for that. Uh, Douglas is a place where, and as several people have mentioned, people care. And I want to tell you a little bit about what I see when I go into a community where people care, because I can tell you within 10 minutes if that's true. I can tell you there is a common bond between Douglas, Georgia, and Milwaukee, Omaha, Denver, Sebastopol, California, Brevard, North Carolina, Cartersville, Georgia, and this town, Douglas. And that common bond is that the people in those communities care. And when you go to those communities, they look different. They have a vibrancy to them. They're well kept. You can tell that people care. And they have institutions that sustain the place. And not just the churches, which are important, but other institutions. For example, here in Douglas, you are blessed to have the Coffee County school system and the high school system, which is one of the best in the state. The principal's here, so we give him a hand because he does a great job of Coffee County High School. Your regional medical center we heard about tonight, one of the best in the state. Not everybody has that. South Georgia State College, it says, continue to improve over time. My mother got to go there one year. Uh, she couldn't afford beyond that. My dad uh, could not go to college. Wiregrass, we heard about Wiregrass Technical College. You've got it. A lot of cities and communities don't have that. You have two museums. I visited both of them today. It's fairly easy to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but you know that the, the flight museum at uh, the airport, I've not visited there before. It's fascinating. And it's a great story. There are, are artifacts in the Smithsonian that relate to that flight training center. And the repair work that's going on on aircraft out there is absolutely fascinating. And the Heritage Museum is, is terrific. And I uh, saw the portraits of my dad and my great-grandfather there because they've been mayors. Celebrating your history and remembering your history is critical to a great community. And you have that. You built the Douglas Trail, the old Georgia and South Florida Railroad that I used to hitch rides on from time to time when I was going home from school has now been converted into a great trail and understanding our plans to expand it. Not everybody has that. It's written up in the literature. You look at the internet, it's a big deal. Because communities that care, take care of their history and take advantage of it. And thanks to the Nature Conservancy, uh, the Georgia Department of Natural Resources, organizations like the Longleaf Alliance, and people like Frankie Snow, you're really beginning to take care of your natural heritage which is so important to protect. We almost lost the longleaf pines. You have endangered species like the indigo snake and the gopher tortoise that are special. They're right here in Colfus County and Jeff Davis County. And now those are being protected. And thanks to the Nature Conservancy and again work by Frankie and others, uh, Broxton Rocks is protected. And as you can learn, certainly from Frankie and others, there are species at Broxton Rocks you will find nowhere else in the world. And that is an important part of your heritage. These are things that people will visit your community to, to see, and when they see that and they're in your community, they come away feeling good about your community. That's important, and we're starting to, to save more of that, and I would encourage you to support those efforts. These are the things I think that make Douglas and Coffee County a thriving community and one with a future, like uh, so many others don't have as we see them around the state. I would say it will only continue to succeed if all of you stay dedicated to this premise that Douglas is important and is worth caring for. But it also takes money. It doesn't happen without funding. 
Philanthropy is an important subject. And you heard some guidance from Bob earlier tonight that was very much on target. I always like this idea of having a plan. I think you have to have a philosophy. And while we have four foundations here, the community leaders need to decide where is Douglas going? And how is this all going to work together to make our community? I think you have to have an overarching philosophy because that gives you your long view of where Douglas is going. Douglas should be here, it was founded you know, back in the 1850s. It should be here another 100 years, another 200 years. Where is it going and what will it look like 50 years, 100 years, 200 years from now? And it needs to, uh, you need to establish your specific fundraising targets within that concept of your larger goal. Many donors, incidentally, may not intend to give to the larger goal, but they want to know where their piece fits. You know, I had an experience at Georgia Tech where we were trying to raise money from a foundation that had never given a significant donation to a public institution. And I made a pitch to them about a concept uh, where Georgia Tech was going to go into biotechnology in a big way. And I said, uh, and, and as I was talking to them about the first building, he said, what else are you thinking about? And I described, because I'd thought about it, the vision of four buildings and what this would do for the city of Atlanta, the state of Georgia, and the opportunities it would create for the young people that would come to Georgia Tech. They got excited. So I got a call from the foundation head, and he said, Wayne, I want to come see you. I'd love to come to the president's house and have breakfast with you and talk to you about our decision. They had never given any money of significance to a public school before. And we were thinking about asking them for $2 million. He came in and he had a Georgia Tech town and I thought, that's a good sign. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, uh, we have made a decision and I was waiting. I thought, you know, maybe, maybe they'll give us a million. He said, we want to give you $20 million. Oh, wow. Because we believe your vision and we want you to use the $20 million any way you need to, to build the four building complex. Not one building, but four building. Those buildings exist today at Georgia Tech because the vision was they wanted to see, and then we had donors who wanted to buy parts of the vision, but the big picture is very, very important. If you're going to raise funding, one of your first jobs is to listen. Learn to listen. While you may have an idea of what you want the donor to give money to, the donor may have a completely different idea. And you may lose them as a donor as a result of it. I had a donor at the Smithsonian, a very dear friend, who had actually given money to Georgia Tech because his father-in-law had gone there. Very successful contractor, tough guy. And he had a foundation, and he wanted to do something for the Smithsonian. Well, I had my ideas. You know, I thought, this tough guy, building, maybe it wanted to be air and space or something. You know, like that. And uh, he, we talk, and I'm, I finally shut up and listened to him. And what became clear was he loved American history. And what he wanted to do was fund an educational center in American history. It had nothing to do with construction. Nothing. That's what he wanted. And he gave $10 million to the Smithsonian to endow a center for history, American, helping young people learn about American history. So you must listen. And it's not listening to, quote, the donor. You are all sitting here as families. Significant philanthropy is a family decision. Spouses, children. Everybody needs to be engaged in the decision. So you're not just listening to a person. You're listening to a couple. You may be listening to a family. And if you engage them all, you do better with philanthropy. Uh, I also think that the key to philanthropy is integrity. Integrity of the deal, integrity of the institution, and several who the earlier speaker spoke about, minding the P's and Q's of the gift. If you make a commitment to an institution to do something, the institution should do that, not something else. And they should be able to explain to you exactly what they've done. They should have the accounting to prove it. Hold them accountable. You should be accountable. Integrity. No one will give you funding if they don't trust you or they don't trust your institution. Integrity is the key to philanthropy. Next, celebrate success. 
steward your dollars. As uh, Benjamin Franklin once said, if you give early to a charity, you'll probably have to give later. <laughs> and you want that to be a joyful giving. <laughs> so stewarding your donors, celebrating your successes, letting them see the young people who are on the scholarships, letting them share the joy of that is important. A lot of people give donations uh, philanthropically through testamentary provisions, and that's wonderful, through their, their wills. But you really don't get to celebrate that gift very much if you're dead <laughs> and you're gone. I think uh, it's a great thing to see the joy on donors' faces when they are with young people and know they provided opportunity for a youngster that may not have had that opportunity if they hadn't made that gift. Very important. Uh, build endowments wherever possible. Institutions need endowments. I know it's hard for people to think about that, but uh, an annual gift is a great thing, but it's gone, and you've got to raise it the next year. Endowments are forever. Endowments support scholarships forever. You know, and uh, I don't doubt a scholarship in my mother and father's name is there forever. And it's for kids from Coffee County. And so endowments uh, last forever and, and is their steward as well. Let me give you just a couple of quick examples on gifts. When I first went to Georgia Tech, I realized I was in the Carnegie Building. And because it was a library. It was the first library built at Georgia Tech and it was built because of Mr. Andrew Carnegie. Very wealthy man, you know, a steel magnet. And Andrew Carnegie made a decision in his life that more and more wealthy people have made recently. That is to give away all of their money. And Andrew Carnegie said, if I am giving away my last dollar when I'm on my deathbed, that's the perfect answer. And he gave away an enormous amount of money. As you know, he built 2,000 2, libraries around there. And one of them was at Georgia Tech. Very early in Georgia Tech's history, that building was built. And it's still there. That's the president's office, but it, uh, it served its purpose as a library. You may not know about the James Smithson gift. The Smithson, Smithsonian is named after a gentleman named James Smithson. But James Smithson was an Englishman. He was a scientist, a uh, very prominent chemist and meteorologist <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and geologist. And that's not a meteorologist, but geologist. And uh, he was very intrigued by our revolution and the concepts behind it of democracy. Uh, he himself was a man of the Enlightenment. He didn't like the class system in England. He thought it was stultifying. Uh, he himself went to, to Oxford, but he went on to the University of Edinburgh because it was an enlightened university. And uh, so in his life, he made quite a bit of money. He was a very successful, um, uh, as I mentioned, geologist. Uh, he also was a very good gambler, turned out. And so we don't quite know where the money came from that he gave us, <laughs> which side of the house, but we took it anyway. <laughs> well, James Smithson in 1826, I remember our country just got out of the War of 1812. Down here, there were still <coughs> Native Americans living here. Wrote a will and left his money to the United States people. Never came to this country. One of the most amazing acts of philanthropy in all of the world's history because he admired our country. It's an amazing story. And we didn't even know he did it. And he said three things. He said, and it's interesting, you know, sometimes people, when they give you money, give you a lot of words about it. He left it wide open. He said, I want this institution to increase and diffuse knowledge. It should be in your nation's capital because you don't have a university there or anything like that. And name it after me. And uh, he left this money to us. Uh, he made one small mistake in his bequest. He left the money to Congress. Now, most of us were thinking about an organization to manage our charitable requests. <laughs> Wouldn't give it to Congress. <laughs> it did take them 10 years, but they figured it out. James Quincy Adams, who used to be president, helped enormously get this done. Uh, there were a number of senators from the South who thought naming anything for an Englishman was stupid. Uh, James Quincy Adams says, but friends, it's free money. And Mr. Smithson didn't like the people who fought wars with us. And so we took it. And it's a good thing we did. Um, today, the Smithsonian has 19 museums and galleries. It has nine research centers. 30 million people go through those museums every year. 
And we don't charge admission. And that's something I fought with Congress while I was there, not to charge admission. I said, look, the American people paid for these buildings. They paid for the collections. Why should they have to pay to see something they own? And it was great for me to walk around the mall and see families who couldn't afford even to eat the lunch at the Smithsonian with their salami and bologna sandwiches, but they were able to go into those museums with their kids for free. That's what it should be today, and it still is. Mr. Smithson's gift was hugely, hugely important to our country. No other country has anything like the Smithsonian. Nothing like it at all. It's an amazing place uh, for the American people. I hope you all go often. I'm going to mention, uh, finally, a program that was started uh, before I left from Georgia Tech uh, for financially disadvantaged students. I, I got concerned as tuition was rising and the state was cutting back its support that we were leaving out qualified students because of financial issues. And I had a study done and it was true. And as uh, Virginia said earlier, uh, there were students who made it into Georgia Tech but had to drop out because they lost the Hope Scholarship uh, or their mother got sick or something and they, and they just couldn't survive. We said, that's, that's wrong. This country is built on a model that a young person with ability, given willing to work hard, should be successful, and that's what makes our country work. My parents didn't have a lot of money. I was fortunate to go on the co-op program to Georgia Tech. And it should be places like Georgia Tech that are for young people who have talent and can exercise those talents and become uh, cont contributors to our economy and to our, co our country. So we started this thing called the Promise Program, and eventually they named it after me, which was not necessary. Uh, since that time, we've had enormous support for that program, and the endowment now is about $16 million. There's another $15 million committed, and before, in, by 2021, it'll be about $30 million endowment for uh, funding the program, helping fund the program. Uh, Francis and Diane Lott made a significant contribution to it. Francis and Diane, we are extremely grateful to you. On behalf of students here in Coffee County who are, uh, come from financially distressed backgrounds to be able to go to Georgia Tech. And the Promise Program tells the student, well, you bring your scholarship money if you have it, but Georgia Tech will see that it pays for your tuition fees, books, room, and board, and you will graduate from this institution with no debt. And Uh, the, new, the president asked me to take a look at the program and saw almost 10 years old and it was a good thing to do and so we just finished the study of it. 671 students have benefited from the program. The average family income is $21,000 a year. The average family income is $21,000 a year. I have met with these students and I promise you I've been there with adults like me where you can't help but not get tears in your eyes when you hear their stories powerful. These are kids who would not be able to go to Georgia Tech and maybe couldn't uh, go to the local schools because of financial issues and they are very serious uh, on, on behalf of our country. We have to work on that. Uh, $21,000 a year is not much money and so uh, we're trying to actually increase that endowment so we can help even more students in this program. The first student was from Brunswick, Georgia, Dwayne Carver. Dwayne Carver's mother was uh, raised him alone, and she got sick and lost her job. Dwayne and his mother lived in her car for three years. But he was an honor student. His counselor called us up when she heard about this program and said, I think I have a student for you. Dwayne Carver graduated at Georgia Tech in three years, worked for IBM, and last year decided he's taking a, a course uh, change in his life. And, was uh, uh, elected uh, or selected to, for law school at Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley, the Bowe Law School. And we're gonna have many more stories like that. There are young people right here, and, and the young man from uh, NOAA is coming to uh, Georgia Tech, thanks to Francis and Diane's gift. Uh, and, and again, the stories they tell you are heartrending. And to think that these kids now can go to school and be great contributors to our country is a remarkable story. And those are just examples of gifts that make a difference. Mr. Carnegie's gift, Mr. Smithson's gift, and the Promise Program 
supported by so many generous people like Francis and Diane, who feel this country should do this. This is not right not to have these kids have this opportunity. These are bright and talented kids. And so I'm proud to have been there and been part of that and to be supportive of this program. I am proud to be from Douglas, Georgia. I brag about Douglas, Georgia every chance I get. When I've been at the Smithsonian, people ask me where I grew up. And I was always proud to say Douglas, Georgia, the best town I ever knew. Thank you. Clough, we have a, a gift for you. This is uh, I recognize that. the handiwork of uh, Jim Cottingham and Frankie Snow, a piece of swift, swift uh, uh, people pottery, and then the rendering of the of the design. Amazing. And uh, we understand that this uh, this pot this kind of type of pottery has been found on your uh, grandparents' it has. property. It has been so we thought it. And the Smithsonian has a great collection of it, but Frankie's got a better collection. <laughs>